and uh, thanks to Gail and the team for organising this. It's really fantastic to see so many patients make the effort um, to spend their weekend in uh, Toronto and to, to learn about PBC and I guess to learn about autoimmune liver disease and to learn about how to, to live well with disease. So what I'm going to try and do, and it's very formal, and I encourage you to ask questions, and when we have the panel section, the other will be taking questions on card, but please feel, feel free now um, as well to, to interject. I'm just going to give you a sort of overview um, of some of the themes that I think we'd like to explore, um, and you'll be exploring, and you'll hear hearing from, from different speakers for, during, during the rest of the day. So, you heard it, a, a cheer. Um, it, it is a historic week. Okay. Um, I have previously spoken at different patient conferences, and uh, I once spoke at a PSC, Primary Scrolls and Cholangitis Conference, and I'm, I'm a royalist, I'm quite clear about that one. Um, and it was great that the Windsors met the Trumps this week. Okay. Now, you heard the cheer. I believe it will be the first time ever a Canadian team will win a, a basketball match, oh, sorry, a competition. So we're obviously very excited. And then this is part of the first ever patient um, conference, uh, certainly the largest ever PBC patient conference in Canada. So it is um, a week which is historic for PBC and all those people who are interested in it. Now, um, what we want to do is to ensure that you go away knowing more about your disease and the context with which you find it, so that you're, it's always, in my opinion, easier to understand and to live with if you've got knowledge. Uh, this is an infographic that was actually produced by some of my colleagues for another charity, but it's actually quite a nice place to start. Okay. I'm not going to ask people to put up their hands if they know what side of the body their liver is. And I'm not going to ask them to put up their hands if they know what side their spleen is. But this is a liver disease. There is no stigma associated with having chronic liver disease. There are many causes of chronic liver disease. And many causes and many people living with chronic liver disease. And 10% of people living with chronic liver disease, it's an autoimmune liver disease. And in the case of PBC, primary biliary cholangitis, it's predominantly a female predominant disease. It's the small bile ducts. And one in a thousand women over the age of 40 will live with PBC. And it's a lifelong journey. It's a lifelong disease. But it's a disease where we've made impact. And we've made impact into good quality care. So Gail wanted a little bit of interaction. So we are interested, because I think it helps the speakers for later on, and I think it helps everyone just generally to know how many people would say they were new PBCers. You might want to put up your hand if you felt you were a new PBCer. Now, I'm not going to define what an old PBC is. <laughs> <laughs> and it used to be that, you know, because as I've, I've grown a teeny bit old, I'm not as old as Mark or Andy. Um, you know, you look, you look at the boss, don't you, and you say, and, and I've asked one of Mark's, Mark, when, when one of Mark's very good friends turned 60, I said, really? You know, so how many people think of themselves as old PBCs? Well, that's good, because actually that's what we want to see, a mixture, but we want people to remember this is a, a lifelong disease. Now, when we look after patients, we realise, as you do, that disease is not separated from life. So we were, are interested to know how many people in the room are just family members. I don't should use the word just but are family members, they're the support team that lead to success. Very good, because this is a team sport, and if you're gonna live with a disease that's chronic, and a disease that's symptomatic, and a disease that has you know, social implications, clearly, you know, we, as we've seen with the Raptors, yeah, team support, teams do best, okay? And then, you know, the goal of a hematologist much as we like transplantation, it's preventative of transplantation. Okay, transplantation is fantastic. It is one of the phenomenal success stories of hepatology in the last 30 years. But how many patients in this room have their own livers? Very good. And how many people have, are gifted a liver? Fantastic. Okay. But that's, you know, the, but the gift of life, and that's what it is, you know, means that this is a lifelong journey. And we've just set up a program in Toronto where our patients are going to be looked after by the same doctors 
if they have PVC before a transplant and if they have PVC after a transplant. And that probably already happens in, in other centres already uh, around the world. Okay. So, do we believe in vision statements? Well, vision statements are actually quite important, I think. Um, I don't write them very often, and you know, I certainly don't read as many, read all the vision statements that get sent to me by the Department of Medicine. Um, but it's important um, to be proactive if we're going to live with PVC and if we're going to make a difference for our patients with autoimmune liver disease. Because for a long time, if that wasn't the case, for a long time, the journey was just considered to be slow and maybe not very important. And why would you prioritize PVC over other diseases? But we do have a vision statement for autoimmune liver disease that we do want better treatment, targeting better ways, encompassing quantity and quality of life. And we want therapy that works, is effective, accessible, and the right people get the right treatment at the right time, and we engage with our patients to make sure we have the right evidence that the new treatments and the new therapies work, we have proof of efficacy, and at those medicines, because nothing comes for free. Okay, this isn't Trump land, actually. Nothing comes for free. You know, you want good drugs, but then there will always be some side effects, and I, I very much doubt we'll ever get to therapies that have no side effects. But those side effects are tolerable, and more important, understandable, because then in that partnership, um, our patients will be happy to, to use those therapies. And those therapies are not just, as I said, to prolong life, but quality of a life. You know, so just remember, at the moment, what's in clinical trial development for PVC are drugs to prolong life, but we're also doing trials for symptoms like itch. Okay, so we're, we're working on both. Okay. Now, <laughs> You know, people will always ask themselves, and this is going to come up in the, in the next session where we have the chance to talk about genes, environment, um, and how many people have PVC and what causes it, okay, but, but why me, okay? And it is an interaction between who you are, which is your genes, and where you live and what you do, which is your environment. But your environment is obviously more than just what surrounds you, but it's, it is also um, what's with you. Now, I'm fascinated by these only because I didn't realise they were real. I'd seen them in the movies, okay, uh, because there's a, I think it's Disney, the Disney movies, and I was awake for these parts. Um, so does everyone know what this is? It's a stop. Okay. Now, do we know why do they hang upside down? Do people know why they hang upside down? <laughs> Even Professor Mason is <laughs> yeah? So do you know why? So I'll tell you why they hang upside down, and I'll tell you why I, I want you to think about why, what that means for, for their life. So sloths have a diet which is very, very heavy in green leaves. Okay? And greenery. And that's very hard to digest, and it takes a long time to get all the energy out of the of, of leaves. Okay? So as a result, they aren't the fastest animal in the world. <laughs> okay? And being not the fastest animal in the world, their predators are a little bit quicker than them. And one of their predators is the eagle, okay? And the eagle will very happily pick them off, but will pick them off less if they hang upside down in the trees, okay? So they hang upside down because of their lifestyle. Now there's a problem, and this is all about the message of environment, genes and how it all comes together and why people get what they get and how as humans and as animals we've adapted. If you hang upside down all the time, does anyone want to sort of conceive of what might be a problem? Well, digestion is one thing, but something even more important than that. We don't like other specialties to think they're more important than the liver, but there are these other people like, you know, the, the heart doctors and the lung doctors who get in our way. But if you hang upside down all the time, you can't breathe. Okay? Because your bowel and your liver will compress your lungs and you can't breathe. And so to adapt to the environment, which is the message that we all adapt to our environment, we all respond to our environment, and some of our responses are protective and some of our responses may be, you know, deleterious because we're living so long. Um, when they did post-mortems on slots and 
believe it or not, there are scientists who you know, work in parts of the world where there are lots of sloths who did postmortems on sloths. They discovered, unlike humans, that the liver is connected to the diaphragm by fibrous tissue, and as a result, does not squash the sloth's lungs. Okay? So, very smart, these sloths. But the message is, and it's the same message for PBC or for any of our diseases, even getting pneumonia tomorrow when you catch a bug, okay? Genes and environment and how you respond. And that is what's happening in patients with PBC. You have a genetic architecture that is ever so slightly different to other people um, outside of Pearson or in Toronto. And in the correct context, a variety of different environmental triggers, we don't know what they are, and they may be transient, they may be persistent, they may be you know, fluctuating for all we know, will come together and will start the inflammation. And then how you respond to that inflammation will be the journey that you have for PBC. And then on top of that, we treat you, and some people respond better and some people respond less well. And at each of those stages, there's a balance of genes and environment. And along that escalator, you know, it's, it's always moving, but there's, there's, there's this balance. And that's why people get disease. But that's why if we have one name, there are at least 150 types of PBC, because they're in the room, okay? You know, we're all slightly different, and everyone's disease behaves slightly different. The next thing, I think, just to get conceptually over, um, when we think about what we want from um, living with disease and what you want as patients and what you want from your doctors and your healthcare providers, is I wish it was as simple as this nice drawing, um, which I pinched from the internet. Well, actually, the Wellcome Trust in, in London has got a phenomenal uh, medical history library, um, which is just very, very good. But, you know, it would be nice to tell you that therapy was obvious. <coughs> and that the journey from having the idea about a drug to getting that drug to patients is easy. But in fact, it is torturously hard, expensive, tricky, very, very, very risky, and the vast majority of good ideas do not become therapies for our patients, okay? Despite sometimes people thinking it's obvious. And the only way we've made progress with diseases like PBC and other liver diseases where we really have made progress and changed people's lives is by working with our patients and patients taking part in clinical research and taking part in clinical trials and working as a team between patients, doctors, um, industry, regulators, trying to work out that pathway to getting new drugs to patients because it isn't easy. And even when you get a drug onto the market, you don't know everything about it and it takes time. So therapy, I'd like to say, is obvious, but it's actually a bit harder than that. Then, you know, um, much loved of doctors, um, because we believe we can simplify things, is, you know, the concept that everything can be mapped out. I used to work for a very, very um, good hepatologist. He's not retired yet, Andy. Uh, Alex Jimson, okay? And Alex is a phenomenal hepatologist back, back in the UK. And he, he was a very calm guy. And, you know, I'd be on service with him and I'd be saying, you know, so if we do this today and this happens tomorrow, what, I'll do that. And what do you think I should do on Wednesday? What should I do on Friday? And you just take a deep breath and he says, I'll tell you um, on Friday, okay, <laughs> when I see what's happened on Thursday, okay? We'd like to map out the whole journey, but we can't, okay? And we have guidelines that we, we write to help clinicians all around the world know everything about the disease. But at the end of the day, okay, um, you know, I'll be happy to give you innovative thinking. What are the guidelines? The message is patients are individuals, and we treat the whole patient. Okay? And everybody is slightly different, and they're slightly different medically, socially, where they live, the healthcare structures, the healthcare environments, you know, the balance between primary, secondary, tertiary care. And as a result, you know, that's why it's a, it's a discussion and the guidelines are just frameworks for what we'd like to do. And the other thing, you know, <laughs> you really can learn a lot from Donald Trump. You know, on the one hand, he's a pretty successful guy. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes he probably doesn't um, take that time to take a deep breath. You don't die of liver tests. 
okay? And the same message then applies. And actually, Mark was talking about this yesterday beautifully, okay? You don't always need to jump, you know, feet first, immediately react because something's changed. You are allowed to reflect. You are allowed to talk to your patient about their options, okay? And you are allowed to take a bit of time to decide what you're going to do. Because generally, you know that's not the same for every medical scenario, I mean obviously there are some medical scenarios where you want your doctor to do things properly and spot on, but broadly for a chronic disease like PVC, which is lifelong, where the journey can go for 20, 30, 40 years, you don't have to necessarily make all the decisions in those 10 minutes of precious time when you have the consultation. Now, the disease. Okay, you're going to hear more about this during the day from various different colleagues amass across Canada. Now, why do I show you this? Because we don't do liver biopsy very often, but liver biopsy is a really fascinating hepatologist. We love them. They okay, to look at it. <laughs> they really are very interesting. But, so this is PVC. This is a small bile duct, and you've got loads of small bile ducts. And I just want you to notice really two things about PVC, um, because it is a liver disease. One is that around the, the bile ducts, there are lots of white cells, lots of blue dots. They're inflammatory cells. And the second thing is, if you look very carefully, okay, often not appreciated in the, the reports, and many of our patients will now read their biopsy reports. Our patients certainly read their biopsy reports online before I've even had a chance to look myself, because we have a, a web portal, which is great. Okay, keep it on my toes. Okay, but you can see the tiny little holes in the very, very small biliary epithelium, in the very, very small bile duct. Okay? There is the problem. Your small bile ducts are surrounded by an army of, of white cells attacking them, for whatever reason, with genes and environment, and they are punching holes in those small bile ducts. And the response to that is both of those small bile ducts might wither and not be there, and then they won't function. But the constituents of what should be in there, which is the bile, can leak out. And can it leak out in the wrong place? So it's like having a leak where you don't want to have a leak. Okay? You want these tubes to be delivering the bile to the bowel, but in fact what's happening is that within your liver, little bits of bile are leaking out in where they shouldn't, which is then why this disease is both an autoimmune disease, the lymphocytes triggered by whatever, plus a biliary disease, a cholestatic disease, the consequences of bile hanging around in your liver, and that in its own right is a harsh environment for your liver and for you to cope with. And many of the symptoms may be coming from <coughs> the fact that the bile is leaking out and is, is, is causing some of these more generic, general symptoms, which are not specific necessarily to PVC, like fatigue, joint aches, dry, dry mouth, um, uh, bone ache, etc. Okay, so then to, to wrap this up, um, uh, in the last few slides before we, we, we get my colleagues to come and, and talk, we do have guidelines, but one of the things that we are trying to encourage, again, with um, patients, and we're actually going to put this care pathway onto the PBC Society of Canada, the Canadian PBC Society website for physicians, in an interactive way by the end of the year, is the concept of care pathways. The concept that although your disease is rare, that doesn't mean you should be treated any differently to someone who's got diabetes and goes to their family doctor and there's just, like, there's just a checklist of things that they need to do and they do the same thing for everyone who comes in the, the door, diabetes, hypertension, you name it, okay? So a care pathway where really, number one, this is all you really want to focus on, get a secure diagnosis. Because if national clinician tells you something with some confidence and tells you exactly what's wrong with you, it's pretty hard to buy into the concept of what therapies you should take and that you should take those therapies for life and the choices you should make. So the first thing you know, we want our patients to get is a secure diagnosis. And really, you should be able to get that with PVC. If you've got autoimmune liver disease, that you know, par excellence can be diagnosed pretty confidently. We want everyone to be offered therapy, okay? And we want everybody to understand their risk, okay? Because patients are often very worried about stage of disease. And of course, stage of disease is impactful, whether you have cirrhosis or not. But actually, because of the way people present nowadays with PVC and with all liver diseases, we pick up people long before they've got late stage disease. We want to tell people where they are on their risk. Where is their journey going to take them? 
What is the speed that they're going to go from where they are now to where they might be in 5, 10, 20 years? And what do they therefore need to do to prevent that? Okay? And that's understanding risk. So we want to understand what your risk is, which really, actually, quite simply in PPC, comes from your blood tests and a few other facets. Okay? We then give you a medicine, and we don't want you to go away. Okay? We do want you to come back. And we do believe you should be looked after for life. Now, it might be a mixed job whether you're looked after by primary, secondary, tertiary care, but somebody's looking after you and they're looking at your blood tests and they're telling you, did you respond to the treatment? Okay, why is that the case? Because we have more than one treatment nowadays. And in the future, some of the treatments will be combined into one tablet. Okay, so unless we identify who's responding to a treatment, okay, and tell them whether they're doing well, or tell them whether they need more, then of course it's a challenge. And again, that's a clear message that we're encouraging our clinicians. Okay? Because beyond ursidioxicolic acid, which is the hepatologist's friend, okay, because generally a safe drug, okay, we now have licensed therapy of eticolic acid and other trials and other repurposed agents um, which are coming your way, we hope. Okay? So the last thing, which of course is very important, we talked about quantity of life, we talked about quality of life, and that's something that it will segue nicely on to my <coughs> colleagues, okay, is this disease is impactful beyond the liver for reasons we don't fully understand, although we are, um, not me personally, but people like Mark are exploring. The consequences beyond the liver, dryness, um, bone ache, itch, other autoimmune diseases, you might have CDAC, rheumatoid, Sjogren's, um, lupus, steroderma. This concept of fatigue, and I really I should update this because any, any of you who follow my sort of um, occasional Twitter um, uh, tweets, you know, fatigue is probably the, is, a, is a difficult term, and I wonder if we're really talking about a lack of, you know, a battery that runs flat too quickly. Okay, so it's, it's a complex terminology. Low bone mass and actually abdominal discomfort is a feature of. That's been a lot harder to tackle because these symptoms don't necessarily correlate with your, bi your blood tests. They run a different course, but they're as important. Okay, so to conclude, okay, we think that PBC is important. We think it's fantastic that you're here today, and we hope that what we can do um, is A, listen to you, but B, let you know our thoughts, and you'll discover that there's a whole array of opinions about PBC. And the goal of um, living with PBC for the future should be, now, you know, this is obviously, I've only been back in Canada just over, uh, under a year now. So this is Ryanair or EasyJet, for those of you who've ever been to Europe, I guess, I don't know, Alaska Airlines, um, or West, dare I say it, WestJet. Okay, you're flying economy. We don't want our patients flying economy going forward. Okay, flying economy, getting second best um, nutrition. Okay, we want, with effort, and with innovation, and by doing things differently, to move you up to first class. This is how um, Andy probably got here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that personal suite on Emirates, okay, and that very expensive glass of wine to enjoy the Raptors match with. Okay. So, um, without further ado, that, those are my comments to, to introduce um, this journey for you—a a lifelong ticket, not a limited ride. <laughs>